Welcome, friends, to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, Loz returns to drink a few liveners and pick up the tale of the Pale Prince of Ruins as we dig in to The Weird of the White Wolf, a 70s collection of tales that, in my case, form the Grafton edition with the striking Michael Whelan cover depicting Elric wearing a fetching but sadly torn green frock astride some ugly fella and driving Stormbringer into the poor guy's chest. We'd already covered the first part of this collection, The Dreaming City, all the way back in episode 1, so only a 79 episode gap, as this is episode 80. There are reasons for that gap of course, not least of which is the baffling way in which Elric Tales were originally released back in the 60s and 70s, and then consumed, often piecemeal, according to which anthology we had to hand by the likes of Loz and myself in the 1980s. As usual, we get into that, and the publishing history of the two tales we'll be discussing a little bit in our yakking. So, fill your wine mug and join us as we return to the Young Kingdoms for some adventuring in the company of Elric and a slate of traditionally odd beers. The Weird of the White Wolf. I also listened to the. I was sort of listened to the audio book again. Yeah. And forgot about Moonglum's Yorkshire accent. Ah. I don't mind Moonglum having a Yorkshire accent. I do. do you? Made me really cross. No, because if, if we do any readings, I'll do his in a Yorkshire it, accent. It'll be it? like, oh, all right, Tower Elric. <laughs> <laughs> it was more. <laughs> the guy doing the voices was like, yeah, all right, Elric. Yeah, passes that horse. <laughs> uh, well, on, on that on that Yorkshire accent, um, we did the dreaming city didn't we? controversy. Yeah. Uh, Loz is back in Derry and Tom's. Hello, Loz. Hi. And yeah, we're doing the Weird of the White Wolf. But of course, as you mentioned, we did the dreaming city. It's our first ever proper. Was that our first full ever episode? Was yeah, it? it was. Yeah, I did the uh, the little. This is what breakfast ruins. Breakfast. For, this is well, 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 This is what breakfast. When he had one beer. Mm-hmm. This is what Breakfast in the Ruins will be episode with Phil. And then our first proper episode was The Dreaming City. Yes, indeed. Did we um, did we do The Dream of Earl Ubeck? I think we talked about it briefly yeah. when we did The Dreaming City. But for today, I thought, you know what? Let's... Whatevs. Let's just uh, carry on with Weird of the White Wolf. So for the purposes of this podcast, we've been pretty pretty brave because while the gods laugh comprises book two of Weird of the White Wolf, it we is. also said we'd do the singing citadel as well. We did. So crazy bastards. Let's see we how we go with that one. Um, wow. Yeah. So Weird of the White Wolf uh, published probably I think published in the seventies. Yeah. And actually, a, a fix-up novel of several stories that were all published probably sixty-one, sixty-two. And actually, there is a a little um, dedication at the beginning of this to the memory of Ted Carnell. Editor of New Worlds and Science Fantasy, Science Fantasy who published all the Elric, all the early Elric stories, and at whose suggestion I first began to write the series. A kind and generous man who gave me such encouragement in my early years, and without whom these stories would never have been written. So yeah, these are all written probably over the space of a couple of years. Um, originally published as The Stealer of Souls was of course the first was collection it? of all these stories. Yeah, but it gets complicated. And we'll talk about this because, as usual, the actual publication order versus writing order versus yeah. chronological order is all a complete nightmare. And some might argue quality. Yes. <laughs> well, well yeah, yeah, true. Chronological quality order. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm. I suppose if you did them actually in quality, well, that's another argument. Yeah. yeah. Do you do them writing order, publication order, narrative chronology, yes. or quality order? Exactly. Ooh, that would be a terrible argument to get into. Yeah, uh, let's but yeah, not do that. So, Steeler Souls, published in 67, I think, had the Dreaming City, uh, Dreaming City, While the Gods Laugh, and then, of course, uh, The Singing Citadel was written in 67, so that slots in after this, but yes. at the time, when this was published, The Steeler Souls, Kings in Darkness, and The Flamebringers. But, of course, that doesn't work out as you, as you go along. We'll so they were the, those ones in the Steel of Souls were in Bane of the Black Sword 
collection, That's right. weren't they? Yeah, and they all got retitled because the Sleeping Sorceress, I think, was retitled The Vanishing Tower, and yes. some of the stories were changed. The Vanishing around. Tower as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it all gets a little bit complicated. No wonder nobody has a clue about any of the Elric chronology because it's just no. all over the shop, isn't no, it? No, it is. Um, fortunately, if you've got the Golanx Stormbringer collection, published in around about 2013 or 14 or whatever, uh, there is John Davies. Um, reader's guide, new reader's guide for yeah, yeah. It's, it's in, in yours as well. as well. It's in the new um, saga edition. Yeah, which is rather beautiful, and it's very useful that reader's guide as well. So yeah. instead of listening to us crap on just read about that. how complicated yeah. it is, get hold of that and just read that instead. I'll give John a shout. Oh yeah, see how indeed. he's doing. You know what, yeah. John Davy is a really nice guy. He has his own website, Jade Design, where you can Jade with a Y where you can buy all sorts of Mocock rarities and various bits and bats. I've had quite a few things off there over the years. And he's, uh, when you email him, he's a really nice guy as well. So well, there you go then. So support John Dave. Yeah, give him, a sh- give him a shout. Yeah. He probably likes beer as well. Yeah. Now, before we crack into the Weird of the White Wolf, or While the Gods Laugh initially, we've just had our first our first livener to get us going. Yeah. And we had a Jiddler's Tipple by By the Horns Brewing Company, Sweet as Pacific IPA. Which is what you brought over. It did. It was very nice, I thought. It was. It was very refreshing. That was a nice 5%er. But I'm not going to read the, the blurb on that because we've drunk it already. Yeah. So I think what we'll probably need to do is work along this line. What, well, that way? Well, because we've, we've got stouts and porters yeah. on the right. And on the left, we've got um, not stouts and porters. Which we'll, we'll talk. So I suppose we could mix them up. Or we could just accept the fact that after the Trappist one at number two... We are going deep into the rabbit hole of stouts and porters, although you have brought a raspberry berliner. So what we could do is go along the line, and when we get to the point where we're going, oof, the stouts are getting a bit thick. I've brought two, haven't I? Yeah, we could go with a raspberry berliner. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd, we could just mix it up. We could probably do some matching. I'll tell you what, your call then. You choose first, and I'll, I'll go next. Uh, I didn't bring any well, dice. The, the ones I brought, mm-hmm. uh, I... Bought them because they look quite unpleasant, right? As, as is our wants. So okay, so sh- choose the... one of the ones that I I put on the table. Uh, what's this for? Uh, just well, that's it. You've chosen it now. Yeah. So unlucky. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is um, and this is left over from the Christmas stash. Oh, this is an Amundsen Brewery Christmas morning breakfast waffle stout. And it looks like you on the front. It does a little bit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and uh, there is yeah, there is nothing on there to get into in terms of crap annoying AI generated blurb. So no. let's just get into it. Yeah, let's. Uh, ooh, yeah. yeah. So, ooh, it's very dark. Yeah, but it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, uh, it smells very sweet. And I've spilled on my slacks already. Oh no! Luckily, they're a, a robust pair of jeans, yeah. and but, not a chino. Uh, yeah. yeah, which yeah. As it's a breakfast waffle stout, it obviously is going to be sweet. But anyway, so book two of The Weird of the White Wolf, While the Gods Laugh, yeah, starts with a little, <clears throat> a little bit of Mervyn Peak from Shapes and Sounds, 1941. And it says, I, while the gods laugh, the world's vortex am, maelstrom of passions in that hidden sea, whose waves of all time lap the coasts of me, and in small compass the dark waters cram. Yeah, I like Mervyn Peake. Yeah. Not so much his poetry. Yeah, I've got a fucking clue what he's on about, no. frankly. Um, but thanks for that, Mervyn. And I know I know Mocock was a big fan, and I'm sure there are people out there who think we're absolute wankers for dismissing it so out of hand. But you know well, what? Well, Gormengast's brilliant. Well, yeah, I've, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, I never got through Gormengast. You're not. Yeah. So, yeah, While the Gods Laugh, first published issue 49 of Science Fantasy in October 61. Then again in Steel Cells in 67. Uh, then they all got all screwed up order-wise, of course. Um, we covered book one, The Dreaming City, in our very first full episode. So we kick off with Elric sulking down the pub. Yeah, yeah. It's very... I thought this the, the whole story was very much a, a D&D game. Oh, yeah. 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 You've but, got Elric down the pub sulking. Yeah. Random... Random woman turns yeah. up. Says, help me get this MacGuffin. Yeah. He goes, can I? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, can I? And then, um, oh, I've actually come up with a character motivation for <coughs> why I want to help you get this MacGuffin. Yeah. And then later on she says, oh, I'm not sure we should get this MacGuffin now yeah. because she's a bit fickle. And and he goes, we are going to get the MacGuffin. Yeah. Then they ask some random mon- monster encounters. Yeah. Of varying quality. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But 
Yeah, I well, yeah, well, we'll come to it at the. At the uh, I think you can probably split the whole book into the fights, yeah. basically, can't you? Yeah. So, you know, well, let's let's start off in the pub. Yeah. So it is in the pub. It says one night as Elric sat moodily drinking alone in a tavern, a wingless woman of Mern <laughs> came gliding. <laughs> out, there'll be a lot of that. Came gliding out of the storm and rested her lithe body against him. Her face was thin and frail boned almost as white as Elric's own albino skin, and she wore flimsy pale green robes which contrasted well with her dark red hair. The tavern was ablaze with candle flame and alive with droning argument and gusty laughter, but the words of the woman of Mern came clear and liquid, carrying over the zesty din. Zesty I have sought din. The I like zesty that. din. Like pretty good. Zesty din. Mm. I have sought you twenty days, she said to Elric, who regarded her insolently through hooded crimson eyes and lazed in a high-backed chair a silver wine cup in his long-fingered right hand and his left on the pommel of his sorceress rune sword, Stormbringer. So she turns up. She says, I need to, you to help me. Um, he says, oh, a long time for a beautiful and lonely woman to be wandering the world. I am Elric of Melnibonair, as you evidently know. I grant no favours and ask none. Bearing this in mind, tell me why you have sought me for 20 days. So she, she, she's not happy with his supercilious tone. She's she? not, um, no. but she has a proposition for him. Yeah. She calls and him a bitter man. Though, she does. She? she says, What do you desire most in the world? Elric says, Peace. He smiles lie. ironically. And then he comes out with the greatest chat up line yes. in the history of fantasy novels. <laughs> he says, Let me remind you a little of the truth. Call this legend if you prefer. I do not care. A woman died a year ago on the blade of my trusty sword. He patted the blade sharply, and his eyes were suddenly hard and self mocking. Since then, I have courted no woman and desired none. Why should I break such secure habits? If asked, I grant you that I could speak poetry to you, and that you have grace and beauty which move me to interesting speculation, but I would not load any part of my dark burden upon one as exquisite as you. Any relationship between us, other than formal, would necessitate my unwilling shifting of part of that burden. He paused for an instant and then said slowly, I should admit that I scream in my sleep sometimes, and am often tortured by incommunicable self-loathing. Go while you can, lady, and forget Elric, for he can bring you only grief to your soul. Which you think most women would be a bit turned off. Yeah. I think you have. You, you did miss out one bit. Yes. Yeah. Because his opening gambit uh -huh. was, after he said peace, was he smiled ironically and said, I am an evil man, lady, and my destiny is hell doom doomed. Mm. So that's his, uh, yeah. That's I, his I opening, thought, that was oh, his opening gambit. Yeah, I always thought, hold my pint while I go for a shit was a bad chat of line. Yeah. But this one it is. probably it tops. Is, it is a very it's bad, quite bad, isn't it? Yeah. We haven't yeah. um, commented on it. No, no. It's all right. Um, I expected it to be sweeter and nastier. It's actually all right. Yeah, it's actually better than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually yeah. quite drinkable. Yeah, well done, Emerson Brewery. Yeah, well, well done. You'll do. You'll do for us. And you got Andy on your cover, which is good. Mm. Yeah, it is a pretty bad chat of line. Yeah. But this is when um, I think after his uh, his gaudy clothing period, he's he's kind of left that behind, doesn't he? Yeah. And now he's like, he's a doom lord, isn't he? I'm wearing black. Yeah. You know, I'm well into black now. Yeah. I don't I don't do gaudy kilts. I yeah. don't dress like a burke anymore. No. I'm I'm a goth. Yeah. And uh, that might be was the the first one written after this one. No, no. This is the second one he ever wrote. It is. Yeah. But, right, okay. So The Dream and City was the first Elric he ever wrote. Yeah. This okay. is the second. So but, so when he's writing this, Elric is only 50, 40 or 50 pages old. Yeah. In so terms that's, of development. So that explains quite a bit, doesn't yeah. it, with, with the story when it's like, ooh, I've got a crowbar Basil exposition in there quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So he's, he's, got, <clears> to, he's got to explain, you know, why he killed his previous love and everything else. But, yeah. you know, it's it's always been... Quite opposite that, written as they were as shorts, these tales always allow for some passage of time in yeah, between yeah. them. Yeah, and you know, Murcox in his early twenties writing these, still relying on tropes laid down by Robert E. Howard in all of his two fisted tales. It like is Conan, very, is very Conan, very yeah, yeah, yeah. like um, whereby episodes in the life of the hero, yeah, are just short instances that can Usually be months, in the or, yeah, months or sometimes years. Yeah apart in the case of Conan even decades apart and that allows the author later on the latitude to parachute in other takes anywhere where there's a handy gap 
and of course we've experienced that already with the Fortress of the Pearl. Yeah. And including the shifts in tone and style that could be really, really jarring if you read them in narrative order. But anyway, so, Elric is so sulking down the boozer. He is, and uh, have we given it? Well, it's, it's killed Cimmeril. Sharia. His is city it? is raised. Sharia. His people hate him. His mates like Smeagon who joined him on his campaign of Avenger Dead. And his hated enemy, Yakun is toast. So when you're reading this in the narr- in, in the narrative chronological order, there's still sh- there's shitloads of stuff that's happened already. Yeah, yeah. And lots and lots of arcs have been concluded. I wonder if he had those written there. No, he wrote these in 1961. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He didn't write Cattle of a Camel Nibbana. No, exactly. So, yeah. so it's... Um, Probably had a few names. I think it, it, it proves that, you know, just writing quite sketchy, you know, well-written but briefly sketched adventure stories that don't really go too deep on world-building or law yeah. allow you loads of latitude to actually do this stuff further on down the line. <coughs> so, so what has he got left now? Well, mini-adventures, which is basically yeah. the, the next two or three... Um, Elric books are se- sequences of mini adventures strung yeah, yeah. together as fix up novels. Although, of course, um, we did skip Sailor on the Seas of Fate for reasons which we'll get to yeah, yeah. Uh, at some point. And with also Elric at the end of time slots in as well. So, yeah, Fortress of the Pearl, Sailor on the Seas of Fate, Elric at the end of time all slot before this. While the Gods Laugh. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's a good indicator of like, the fucking brain tangle you can get into thinking about all this. Um, and thinking about it as a sequence. Yeah, because even the Elric of Fortress of the Pearl is not this dude, is it? No, no. Elric of Fortress of the Pearl is banking on the reader's familiarity with all of the Elric stories yeah. in his development. Isn't it? But as written, this is the sequel story to The Dreaming City, so you know, Elric's only about 30 or 40 pages old at the moment. So we've got Shirilla, a femme fatale that's equally as depressed as Elric. Yeah, bit bit grumpy. What a setup. I mean, what what's her motivation, really? She's bummed because she's got no wings. I think it's a bit of a spoiler there, but yeah. Yeah. That, that's it. That's yeah. the motivation. Yeah. She's not a deep, particularly well-drawn character. No. Although she's hot, she's got red hair, and she wears a green dress. Yep. So this quest for the MacGuffin ensues. The Dead God's Book. The Dead God's Book. You have heard, of course, of the Dead God's Book, mm. she asks. Elric nods. He was interested. Despite the need, he felt to disassociate himself as much as possible from his fellows. So I think he, he sets him up, doesn't he? As he's a massive loner. Uh, he's got he's infamous, isn't he, across the young kingdoms mm-hmm. now? As you know, everybody is he's, he's all he's, he's a famous guy, and yeah. he's like that's Elric that pissed around with him. Yep. He's got a soul stealing uh, hell sword, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. So he's so he's kind of set him up as most people know who he is now. Yeah. After he's, his uh, his legend proceeding, yeah, yeah. he's got he's got a reputation. Yeah. Yeah. So she, why does she want the Dead God's book? It's because she ain't got no wings. Yeah. In it. So why does Elric want the Dead God's book? Why does Elric suddenly find? Well, yeah, you know what? This sounds pretty interesting. So it says. So they've set off, and it says, The next morning, as the Baroque camp, folding the rustling fabric of the yellow silk tent between them, Sharilla avoided looking at Elric directly, but later, since he made no move to speak, she asked him a question in a voice which shook somewhat. It was a question which she needed to ask, but one which came hard to her lips. Why do you desire the dead god's book, Elric? What do you believe you will find in it? Elric shrugged, dismissing the question, but she repeated her words less slowly with more insistence. Very well then, he said eventually, but it is not easy to answer you in a few sentences. I desire, if you like, to know one of two things. And what is that, Elric? The tall albino dropped the folded tent to the grass and sighed. His fingers played nervously with the pommel of his rune sword. Can an ultimate god exist, or not? That is what I need to know, Shirilla, if my life is to have any direction at all. The lords of long chaos now govern our lives, but is there some great being greater than them? Shirilla put a hand on Elric's arm. Why must you know? Despairingly, sometimes, I seek the comfort of a benign god, Shirilla. My mind goes out, lying awake at night, searching through black barrenness for something, anything, which will take me to it, warm me, protect me, tell me that there is order in the chaotic tumble of the universe, that it is consistent, this precision of the planets, not simply a brief, bright spark of sanity in an eternity of malevolent anarchy. Mm. 
Elric sighed and his quiet tones were tinged with hopelessness. Without some confirmation of the order of things, my only comfort is to accept the anarchy. This way, I can revel in chaos and know, without fear, that we are all doomed from the start, that our brief existence is both meaningless and damned. I can accept, then, that we are more than forsaken, because there was never anything there to forsake us. I have weighed the proof, Shirilla, and must believe that anarchy prevails, in spite of all the laws which seemingly govern our actions, our sorcery, our logic. I see only chaos in the world. If the book we seek tells me otherwise, then I shall gladly believe it. Until then, I will put my trust only in my sword and myself. Yeah. So he's having an existential crisis, he is. basically. And he wants to know if God exists. Yeah, and he wants to know if there is an ultimate God. Yeah. Is there monotheism? Yes, yeah. which isn't going to mention much in the other stories, is it? It's more the, the hand of the balance, I suppose. Yeah, I think, how much is that 20... Two-year-old Michael Moore, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. venting his old um, kind of frustrations with the world and his view of everything because well, Elric is basically a cipher for, yeah, for young Moorcock. He it? said that, didn't he? Yes, yeah. and he was, yeah. But it is interesting reading that because you know you read loads and loads of Elric over the years, and I don't ever recall him having that kind of you know he's he's always been in some some sort of crisis, but that kind of existential yeah. crisis that goes beyond the Lords of Chaos, the Lords of Entropy, and the balance. It's something I, I didn't even remember. It kind of took me by surprise when I read it. Apart from the last line in Stormbrew. Oh, well, yeah. yeah. We'll get to that in That's 17 true. years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we get into a series of random encounters. Totally random. Yep. The first one is that the... Belbane, Belbane the, the Mist Giant. giant. Yeah. Which actually is quite good. It's all right. But yep. there's, a, there's quite a lot of duet machina in this entire book, isn't there? Oh, there always is. Isn't yeah, it? but more so than usual. Yeah, there always is. Um, and to, to be honest, I like the Bellburn thing just because you've got really you've got three random encounters on the road in this. You've got Bellburn the Mist Giant, which I think is really cool, and I think Mike's juices are flowing quite nicely at that point, especially in all the descriptions and everything. Yeah, it's good. Then you've got the hunting dogs of the Darzy. Yeah, dogs with beaks, obviously less good. All right, feathered dogs with beaks. Yeah, less Dog interesting birds, for me, if you will. Yeah, um, and you know later on you get clackars, yeah, apes with wings. Yeah, there's a bit. I wonder if that was influenced by Wizard of Oz. Quite yeah, a lot. I mean I don't know. It's it's all, it's all a bit training paddock stuff for me when it comes to random encounter monsters. You know, eventually. Mocock will get to the good stuff like, you know, mutant war jaggy was of Asia Communista. Yeah. And giant we... robot mechanical cat monsters and yeah. and everything else. So you know, there's 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 better to come. Or the um what's the word in the Corum? The sh- winged shark larker. The winged shark larker the and gam. the Carmen Al of Zert. Yeah. Which yeah. sing, but he never has a fight with, which yeah. is a shame. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's like what bears with goiters. Yeah, exactly. Where does it end? Yeah, but it's it's that yeah that kind of mashup. It goes back to Greek mythology, I don't know. Greek mythology just mashed loads of animals together and called it. Oh, it's a chimera. Is yeah. it really? Yeah, it's a slug with a shell. Yeah, oh, oh, well, that's a snail. snail yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a snail. Well, yeah. it's it's the holy snail. Of snails, with, snails with flails. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's been done. That's yeah, been that done. was that was terrible. Yeah, oh, it's actually, actually once you start thinking about it, it's quite hard, isn't it? It I'm is. Yeah. Bears with goiters. That's it. I'm yeah, done. Yeah, but. There must be some other ones, you know, like yeah. horse. There's generally a horse-based one, isn't there? Yeah. So you got your centaurs and your yeah, yeah, yeah. Pegasus, etc. I'm just pleased he decided to just go with things like bears in attractive green jackets instead. Yeah, and yeah. Make them sort of good guys instead of you know bears with I don't know just, just smelly bears. Two and... noses. <laughs> don't yeah. that would work, would it? Yeah. Uh, is he like, he had these cyclops? Is he no. type larkers in there? No, there's a few. Yeah, they, there's a few crap monsters over the over the years. I think. Yeah, I, I don't quite like the uh, the, the Bell, Bell Ben the Mist Giant though. But um, there's a there's a bit in it that where he starts randomly shouting names for no apparent reason. Oh yeah, I was just like, yeah. We, was there a word count or something he was trying to hit? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm guessing when he's writing this for. For science, fantasy, or whatever they yeah. say, yeah, we'll give you two p a word. Yeah, give exactly. Us it's like, all oh, right, nice one. Yeah, I'll, I'll bang this one in. 
Yeah, so I, I quite like this passage though, um, notwithstanding what you just said. Uh, now we could make out some of the some of its saliences. Yeah. Two eyes, the colour of thin yellow wine, were set high in the thing's body, though it had no separate head. A mouthing, obscene slit filled with fangs lay just beneath the eyes. It had no nose or ears that Elric could see. Four appendages sprang from its upper parts, and its lower body slithered along the ground, unsupported by any limbs. Elric's eyes ached as he looked at it. It was incredibly disgusting to behold, and its amorphous body gave off a stench of death and decay. Fighting down his fear, the albino inched forward warily, his sword held high to parry any thrust the thing might make with its arms. Elric recognised it from a description in one of his grimoires. It was a misgiant, possibly the only misgiant, Belbane. Even the wisest wizards were uncertain how many existed, one or many. It was a ghoul of the swamplands which fed off the souls and blood of men and beasts. But the marshes of the mists were far to the east of Belbane's reputed haunts. Elric ceased to wonder why so few animals inhabited that stretch of the swamp. Overhead the sky was beginning to darken. Stormbringer s- Nom. That beer is making me salivate <laughs> in a strange way. Um, someone should do a beer called Hyper Salivation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure they probably could. Yeah. Stormbringer throbbed in Elric's grasp as he called the names of the ancient demon gods of his people. The nauseous ghoul obviously recognised the names. For an instant, it wavered backwards. Elric made his legs move towards the thing. Now he saw that the ghoul was not white at all. It had no colour to it that Elric could recognise. There was a suggestion of orangeness dashed with sickening greenish yellow, but he did not see the colours with his eyes. He only sensed the alien unholy tinctures. Then Elric rushed towards the thing, shouting the names which now had no meaning to his surface consciousness. Balan! Marthim! Aesma! Alastor! Sabos! Verdelet! Nizilkmi, <laughs> Habarim, Habarim of the fires which destroy. Oh, not Habarim. Oh, God. Oh, not him again. You had to bring him up, didn't you? Yeah, God, we forgot about him. Yeah. Elephant head. Yeah. <laughs> Quick, before he starts singing. Yeah. It's just random nonsense, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, rabbit chops. Yeah, why is he just shouting random words? Yeah. Yeah. Part of him wanted to run to hide, but he had no control over the power which now gripped him and mm. pushed him to meet the horror. Mm. It's quite Lovecraftian a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Except look yeah, nobody in a Lovecraft story would run. attack anything with a sword, no, would no. they? Actually, th- th- there are Lovecraftian bits, but it's usually Oh no, my soul. No. <laughs> dot dot yeah. dot. Yeah. The horror. The horror in the mist. <laughs> yeah. It was a horror in the mist. Well, singing Citadel. It yeah. was a citadel. It was singing. Yeah. It was the, the singing, singing citadel. citadel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, so he gets away with it because he's chanting his names, and then he gets stuck in the swamp for a little bit of extra. Well, extra no, he, peril. He, get, he gets away by uh, summoning Ariok, doesn't he? Oh, again, again. Uh, this is his first Ariok session, right? We, we, we should run an Ariok count. Yeah, and so ring a bell every time. Savagely, grimly he fought, and again he screamed for Ariok. A mind touched his sardonic, powerful evil, and he knew Ariok responded at last. Almost imperceptibly, the mist giant weakened. Elric passed his ad- uh, pressed his advantage, and the knowledge that the ghoul was losing its strength gave him more power. Sorry, I haven't got my glasses. Blindly, <laughs> agony piercing every nerve of his body, he struck and struck. Then quite suddenly, he was falling. Yeah, so he called Ariok. And then he falls in the swamp. He falls in the swamp, and she really just really is quite rubbish, isn't yeah. she? So she she hasn't got a rope. She goes, oh, she rips a top and ties it together, lobs it at him, and then she can't pull him out. She's not strong enough. Yep. Elric's getting a bit cross, isn't he? Yeah, but you know he gets out just in time for the hunting dogs of the Darcy to turn up. Yeah, yeah. and also not just the hunting dogs of the Darcy. What the Darcy? Yeah, no. Our old mate, Moonglum. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's, oh, that's yeah. where he appears. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, Because yeah. he's actually been hunted by he's the... He's been hunted by the, the hunting dogs yeah. of the Darcy. One rider, several of the beasts, Elric said, listening intently. What do your elf eyes see? <laughs> yeah, um, I've, right, okay. So let's let's talk about... That. We're not, I'm not going to dwell too much on the hunting dogs of the Darcy. Because they're a bit crap. Half dog, half bird, lean shaggy bods and legs of dogs but possessing bird-like talons in place of paws and savagely curved beaks which snap where muzzles should have been. The hunting dogs of the Darcy, gasped Shirilla. I thought they were like their masters were long extinct. 
Ugh, anywhere. They're chasing somebody indeed. Chasing a man on a horse. Yep. This and certainly was. He was so a Elric, man. who always is saying, Oh yeah, I'm evil and out of order me. Stay away. Says, Ho there! He shouted to the frantic rider. Turn and stand, my friend. I'm here to aid you. Yeah, I'm well evil. Eh? Yeah, I'm evil as the come. Basically, is edgelord, doomlord, and an evil when it comes to talking to a hot babe at a pub bar. Yeah. But the moment he sees some dude on horseback being chased by animals, his best nature comes out. Yeah. Which is nice. So he's, you know, our mate is uh, described as the, the rider turned his horse and drew a long sa- sabre from a scabbard at, the, at his waist. He was a small man with a broad, ugly mouth. He grinned in relief. What is an ugly mouth? I don't know. Has he got, like, shit teeth? I don't know. It says that twice. Yeah, it's, it's always his a description of Moonglam, isn't it? Yeah. It's like he's got a broad, ugly mouth. Yeah. He does I... describe him later on, doesn't he, when Elric's playing the Guess Where Moonglam's from competition. Yeah. But, yeah, so so they go, ooh, a lucky chance, this meeting, good master. Or, yeah. in the uh, audio book... A lucky chance this morning, good master. Hmm. Yeah. So they have a fight. They, they do. The, they, they kill the dogs. They take care of the Real dogs. Real good. Yeah, they take care of the dogs. But we do get a nice little description of, of yeah. Moonglum and Elric's amusing reaction to him. But, but before that, just to, to go on, he's like, Elric of Melnibane, I replied the uh, Albina, but saw no reaction on the little man's face. Mm. This was strange. For the name of Elric was now infamous throughout most of the world. So there's his, uh, he's, he's almost a bit, bit cross. He's not, mm. you know. And it says intrigued by Moonglum's ignorance and feeling strangely drawn towards the cocky little rider, <laughs> Elric studied him in an effort to discover from what land he came. Yeah. Moonglum wore no armor, and his clothes were of a faded blue material, travel stained and worn. A stout leather belt carried the sabre, a dirk, and a woolen purse. Upon his feet, Moonglum wore ankle-length boots of cracked leather. His horse furniture was much used, but of obviously good quality. The man himself, seated high in the saddle, was barely more than five feet tall, with legs too long in proportion to the rest of his slight body. His nose was short and uptilted beneath grey-green eyes, large and innocent-seeming. A mop of vivid red hair fell over his forehead and down his neck, unrestrained. He sat his horse comfortably, still grinning, but looking now behind Elric to where Shirilla rode to join them. Yeah, and it's it's quite amusing that um, he, he bowed elaborately as the girl pulled her horse to a halt. Elric said coldly, "The lady Shirilla." <laughs> yeah. She's like, yeah. I think it's after a after a crap kind of um, saving him from the swamp piece, wasn't it? It's like, ah, oh, she's right, useless arse. He is such a shit to her. Yeah. For the rest of this story, it's... right up to the end. Yeah, yeah. He's a complete shit to her. But then at the beginning of the singing citadel. They're in the pub, and Elric's like, yeah, I couldn't stay with her. I, cu- <laughs> I couldn't kill another woman I loved. <laughs> that would have been yeah. too much. When you say I loved, <laughs> well, you know, she was all right. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Master so, Moonglum of, of Elware. Elware. Moonglum supplied. The mercantile capital of the East. The finest city in the world. Mm. Elric recognised the name. He's not, not been. Didn't fancy it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't think he goes to the Far East, does no, he? No, Yeah, a new city, is it not? A few centuries old. Have you ridden far? I, I, I do love that they exchange small talk. Then it says, Elric was uncomfortable. Light talk of the kind which Moonglum seemed to enjoy was contrary to his own brooding nature. But in spite of this, he found he was liking the man more and more. It was Moonglum who suggested that they travel together for a while. Shirilla objected, giving Elric a warning glance. But he ignored it. <laughs> he ignored it and went, up yours, a moon glum's hanging out with us yeah. now. Yeah, it's like, no, sorry, love, I've got a best mate now. We're off to watch the football. Yeah, I'm exactly. packing you in. And at the end, is, uh, and what, what do you seek there, moon glum, uh inquired. A secret, Elric said, and his new phone companion was discreet enough to drop the question. <laughs> or just couldn't be asked. He was yeah. just like, yeah, whatever. He, he does seem a bit like, yeah, I'm not really... I, I'll just do whatever, really. Yeah. Like one of the, one of your mates will go, oh, what? Yeah, ice skating. Yeah. Love it. It's brilliant, and it it is very much. It's you know, I don't want to knock Mike as a twenty something year old, but it really does read like uh, how a twelve year old's brain would think when it comes to. Oh yeah, it's all right hanging around with this girl, but look, <laughs> look, a guy who I can go and play 
footy with my best mates. Yeah. yeah. But there's also the thing of like, yeah, I, 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 I didn't realize that I, when I reread it that he was five foot. Yeah. I mean, fucking hell, that's a hobbit, isn't it? Yeah. It's like it's not a tall man. He's a wee fella. He is a wee fella. He's a wee fella with a cruel. Well, I think later on it's cruel mouth. No, I don't think it is. I think it's always no, I think, had in, an I think ugly... in later stories. Is it? Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. Ugly. He's, he's quite. Stick with yeah, ugly. they do. They do call him ugly quite a bit, don't they? Yeah. And he's um. He's quite morally ambivalent as well, isn't he? Oh yeah, very much yeah. so. And we we find that out at the beginning of the next story, don't we? Yeah. 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 So anyway, they they have a quick scrap with some clackars. Well, they they go they go into a cave, don't they? And yeah. It's the usual. Oh, is it a cave? They yeah. go on for ages, and then it comes out at a a massive sea, doesn't it? In the cave. Yeah. And they get a boat. There's quite a good bit where um, because it's basically a beach, isn't it? And on, on the beach, there there are um, loads of skeletons of boats. Yep. And they find one, and uh, I I kind of amuse me. I'm just going to find the page. Hmm. Yeah, are we on Clackars? Are we on Ariokiga? Uh I think we're actually I think we're I think I might have got ahead of myself with Clackars. I think yeah, we're on Clackars. Are... We're on Zombie Men. Yeah, the Darcy appear again, don't they? Yeah. And uh and we're introduced to Grom. Oh yes, we are. So, so he's uh so, you know, part of the the Melna Melnabonian, Melnibian. Yeah. yeah, then what? Yeah, the They've got a close affinity with the um, the elementals, haven't yeah. they? Which is supposed to be the cleanest of the magic. Yeah. And it also gets Mike to come up with some corking names, which are mentioned later on in the story when yeah. he goes through a big list of them, doesn't he? Yeah. So, yeah, so basically the dead lords of the Darzi with more dogs. Mm-hmm. They've got dogs with them again, haven't they? Yep. Start attacking them. You know, the initial plan was ride for the mountains and see if we can outdistance them. They can't. Mm-hmm. I was expecting Shirilla to fall off a horse or something. Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, at least she doesn't. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Elric drags up a broken spell. Uh, sorry, a dredge a spoken spell from his memory, which will dismiss the living dead. It came to him and hoping that the forces he had to invoke would decide to aid him, he began to chant, Let the laws which govern all things not so lightly be dismissed. Let the ones who flaunt the Earth Kings with a fresher death be kissed. Nothing happened. <laughs> I failed, Elric muttered hopelessly as he met the attack of a snapping devil dog and spitted the thing on his sword. But then the ground rocked and seemed to seethe beneath the feet of the horses upon whose backs the dead men sat. The tremor lasted a few seconds and then subsided. Uh, Yeah, there's an earth tremor and small craters form and swallow them all up and boom. Yeah, Bob's your undies. Yep. King Grome appears. Yeah. Ah, Uh, right. We have the very interesting case... Of revised text. Do we? Yes. It's because there is no mention whatsoever of King Grom in this 1984 Granada edition. Is there not? So, so read the King Grom passage. So, although a moan was coming from the lips of the living dead, suddenly a whole area of surrounding hillsides split into cracks and yawning crannies appeared on the surface. Elric and his companions swung themselves onto their horses and with a frightened, multi-voiced scream, the dead lords were swallowed by the earth, returning to the depths from which they were summoned. A deep and holy chuckle arose from the shattered pit. It was the mocking laughter of the earth elemental King Grom, taking his rightful subjects back into his keeping. Whining, the devil dog slunk towards the edge of the pit, sniffing around it. Then, with one accord, the black pack held itself down into the chasm, following its masters to whatever unholy doom awaited it. Moonglum shuddered. You were on familiar terms with the strangest people, friend Elric. I don't know why I did a Cockney accent, because I was playing a game the other day doing Cockney accents. Yeah. What I should have done was, yeah. uh, you're on familiar terms with the strangest people, friend Elric, he said shakily, and turned his horse towards the mountains again. Yeah, so that's largely the same, just ever so slightly revised because it says in mind it was the mocking laughter of the Earth Kings. So it's just it's just name checked Grom oh, right. in Lobbed there. Grom in there. Yeah, lobby men. Why not? Yeah. yeah. And then yeah, so so we had the the Grom section, and then we do have a brief Basil exposition of the Chaos Law piece. Yep. Uh, so they go to um, go to the entrance of the cave. There's a sign of chaos on there. Mm-hmm. 
Um, perhaps I should have guessed. Well, mm. yeah. What does it mean, Elric? So Moonglum is like the uh, Doctor Watson of the pair. Yeah. Going so, shall go the reader's in. proxy. He is yeah. indeed. Yeah. So then, yeah. So we have the. That's a symbol of everlasting disruption. So he basically sets out his whole, not theology, but mythology that he's going to use for pretty much all of his books, isn't yeah. he, in this bit? Yeah, well, you know what, let's read it, because it is a, it is a, a, a good it's description. It's a valuable piece. I, yeah, might have to, I might have to get me glasses. Yeah, that is the symbol of everlasting disruption and anarchy, Elric told him. We are standing in territory presided over by the Lords of Entropy, or one of their minions. So that is who our enemy is. Of course, there might be a difference in text in yeah. yours, but... It's the same so far. Yeah. This can only mean one thing. The book is of extreme importance to the order of things on this plane. Possibly all the myriad planes of the universe. It was why Ariok was... Multiverse. Oh, well. It was why Ariok was reluctant to aid me. He, too, is a lord of chaos. Yeah. Moonglum stared at him in puzzlement. What do you mean, Elric? <laughs> I've absolutely no idea what yeah. you're talking about, you silly bastard. No, you... Know you not that two forces govern the world, fighting the eternal battle, Elric replied. Law and chaos. The upholders of chaos state that in such a world as they rule, all things are possible. Opponents of chaos, those who ally themselves with the forces of law, say that without law, nothing material is possible. Some stand apart, believing that a balance between the two is the proper state of things, but we cannot. We have become embroiled in a dispute between the two forces. The book is valuable to either faction, obviously, and I could guess that the minions of entropy are worried what power we might release if we obtain this book. Law and chaos rarely interfere directly in men's lives. That is why we have not been fully aware of their presence. Now, perhaps, I will discover at last the answer to the one question which concerns me. Does an ultimate force rule over the opposing factions of law and chaos? Mm. Yeah, that's the same. So there you go. So the press on for a while in pitch darkness, and then eventually they come out and there is a sea. There Uh, is a sea. And lots of boats. Yeah. With dead people in them. Right. At that point, we're at chapter four. I finished my breakfast waffle stout. Yeah, it was actually all right, actually. I quite enjoyed that. It was good. Uh, that was a good start. So I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the stout end, and we're going to go with the Neapolitan milk stout. Ooh, what idiot brought that? By Saugatuck Brewery. Yes. Mm, Saugatuck. A creamy milk stout with all the brilliant flavours of Neapolitan ice cream in one glass. Taste the rich flavours of chocolate, vanilla and strawberry in this unique beer. Which mm. I think we should we should actually discuss Neapolitan ice cream. Yeah. Because um, as a kid... It was, the, it was the business. Yeah, it was the business. However, have you ever tried it as an adult? Uh, no. It's absolutely gopping. Really? Yeah, because I've, I've come to the conclusion that... Um, but it's chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream and strawberry ice cream. Yeah, How, no, how, how can it be bad? Because strawberry... Anything is a bit shit, in yeah. my opinion. Right. Strawberry milkshake, bit shit. Yeah. Controversial. Yeah. yeah. The chocolate's a bit powdery. Uh, are we talking we're low talking, quality Neapolitan? Yeah, yeah. We're not talking like your Ben and Jerry's Neapolitan. No, right. I don't think they do it. No, but, I don't think they do either. Because that would be madness. Yeah. But yeah, it's a, yeah, a bit... Yeah, a bit disappointing. Tell you what, it, 70s and 80s, it was the prince. It was. It, it was the... Yeah. It was... Yeah. And occasionally when your grandma went, would you like some tin fruit with that? I'm like, no. No. Why, why would I do that, no, grandma? Yeah. Shove you tin fruit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Neapolitan ice cream. Arctic roll. Arctic roll. Classic. Yeah. Uh, angel cake. Yes. So I've eaten angel cake and arctic roll as an mm. adult. Yeah. And probably recently. Yeah. And it still works. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I ain't had arctic roll since I was a kid. I think I had angel cake a couple of years ago. I'm a sucker for cake. I do like I'm cake. I'm not... A, yeah, I think my my um, my um nana, she used to have a phrase for certain cakes, like, fwa-fwa cakes, right? <laughs> so basically, they were uh, c- cakes that were so light, it was almost <laughs> like the, you always choked on the crumbs. Right. It, was, it was like a fwa-fwa. <laughs> and she, she had... Um, yeah, she. I think Angel Cakes came under the canon of a foie foie cake. Right. She also used to have Baba Cake. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> which which was sure, that's like a contradiction in terms. Where would you have Baba anything? <laughs> it was. It was basically she made a a fruit loaf with all bread. <laughs> 
a babba cake. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I suppose to, to, to people not from Hull, I'm sure this is the case elsewhere as well. But in Hull, babba means shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it did. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I'm going for a bab. Yeah. Which still amuses me now. <laughs> It still, it still amuses me. If you say, what what was True Detective Night Country like? <laughs> well, it was a bit bab, actually. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> well, so do I. Yeah. This is the first thing that yeah. came to my mind. Well, with Matilda, my daughter, because she was trying to annoy her, <laughs> her mum went, I'm just off for a crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, sorry, a massive crap. <laughs> you have to have massive in front of everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah amusing. Uh, yeah, we, we, we need to lead a campaign to get Bab back into common vernacular. Uh, well, I think we're doing it now. Ooh. We Ooh. are. It smells like Bovril. Uh, I have a smell of that. Ah, uh, right. That is a bit of a switch from the last one. It's not terrible, but it's a switch. And it has the back... You, you know you were just talking about strawberry flavour. Yeah. You know when you were a kid and you got those like weird little banana goodies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The duck taste of banana, the taste of banana flavour. Yeah, yeah. So it's like the banana... But that's what the ice cream is, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the banana flavour flavour. Yeah, yeah. And that's what sometimes strawberry flavour tastes like. It doesn't taste a fucking thing like strawberries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It tastes like strawberry flavour. That's why I don't like strawberry cheap ice cream. Yeah. This has got the back-end taste of strawberry flavour, not strawberry. Yeah, yeah. So this is like an odd... It's got a hint of strawberry flavour flavour. Yeah. Well, it could be worse. It could be banana flavour flavour. Couldn't it? Yeah. You don't want that in a beer. But it oh, does... no, actually, I've had banana bread beer. It was all right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's probably works better with the beer, I think. Yeah. But then, yeah, it does smell horrible. Did you ever go to that pizza shop in all that did put banana on pizzas? No. Yeah. Probably, probably, would, probably would do the best. That. Yeah. Fucking idiot. That's yeah. what they're about. Yeah, I'm, quite, I've, I'm quite strict with pizzas, though. I don't, yeah. I don't like messing with pizzas. No. Especially not with fruit. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I personally do like pineapple on a pizza, but banana on a pizza, no. No, you wouldn't. I don't think so. No. I don't think so. I remember, just on the subject of bananas, yeah. it's a, a purpose of nothing, but yeah. um, one of my friends, Craig, he worked for uh, Bird's Eye, and they were de- developing new uh, fish feasts mm. in the in the 80s, stroke 90s, I think yeah. it was. And it's doing them for Germany. It was like a, a layer of cod, then some a layer of banana and then put in some batter. Cod, banana, <laughs> batter. <laughs> batter. Yeah, yeah. Not for not me. sure about that. No, banana and fish. Did you ever have banana fritters from Chinese takeaways or restaurants? Probably when I was younger. Yeah, which yeah. was just a big slab of banana in batter with treacle poured on it. Yeah. It's it's the wrongest thing in the world, but it's strangely yeah. That's what, I compelling. mean. Most things fried are better, aren't they? Yeah. Apart from banana and fish. Yeah. Yeah, banana. Yeah. Substitute the treacle for cod. Yeah. No. <laughs> I am the weaver. I've, I like your idea. I think it could really enhance with a big piece of cod. To be honest, it'd, it'd make a good random encounter monster. Yeah. Banana with cod on it. Yeah. Or a banana fish <laughs> monster. Yeah, no. Right, where are we? No. <laughs> I think we've got distracted with bad no, cake wait. and such things. So, the fights and clackars. Oh, Ape, God. Apes yeah. with wings. Yeah. Let's move on. How do they get... They just kill them, though. Yeah, they? They just, yeah they just kill them. Yeah. 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 And uh, Sh- Shirella just said at one point, oh, they're the ancestors of our race, the oldest things in the world. Yeah, ever. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, ooh, the bit shit, though. Yeah, they? yeah. Um, not convinced personally, no. but then they do get to the castle of the Lords of Entropy. They do, and we get the first incidents, I think, in Mocock of the first proper description of the chaos symbol, probably, where it's you know described as the eight arrows radiating from a central hub. Yeah, which of course, as we know, is everywhere these days. It is, but there it is probably the first description. I reckon, nineteen sixty-one. It's got to be, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Castle of Blackstone, a sprawling pile covered with dark green lichen, which curled over its ancient bulk with an almost sentient protectiveness. Towers appeared to spring at random from it and covered a vast area. There seemed to be no windows in any part of it, and the only orifice was a rearing doorway blocked by thick bars of metal, which glowed with dull redness but without heat. Above this gate, in flaring amber, was the sign of the Lords of Entropy, representing eight arrows radiating from a central hub in all directions. It appeared to hang in the air without touching the black lichen covered stone. Mm. Yeah. So I was only not so long ago I was only playing 
a, I think it's bolt gun, a boomer shooter based on Warhammer 40,000. Oh. Lots and lots of glowing chaos symbols Ugh. and castles. Yeah, so it's 1961 this, and 60 plus years later, it's still a massive motif in Warhammer yeah. 40,000 and Warhammer generally. Mm. So, they've gone through all this effort, they've got to the castle. They meet a giant. They, meet, they do meet a giant. A flaming giant. Because yeah, why yeah. not? Gusty laughter flowed from the mouth of the giant and the scarlet fire fluttered about him. He was naked and unarmed, but the power which flowed from him almost forced the three back. His skin was scaly and of smoky purple colouring. His massive body was alive with rippling muscle as he rested lightly on the balls of his feet. His skull was long, slanting sharply backwards at the forehead, and his eyes were like slivers of blue steel, showing no pupil. His whole body shook with mighty, malicious joy. Greetings to you, Lord Elric of Melnibone. I congratulate you for your remarkable tenacity. <laughs> My name is Arunlu the Keeper, and this is a stronghold of Lords of Entropy. The giant smiled cynically. You need not finger your puny blade so nervously, for you should know that I cannot harm you now. I gain power to remain in your realm only by making that vow. I'll admit the book is of importance to us, but what can it mean to you? I've guarded it for 300 centuries and have never been curious enough to seek to discover why my masters place so much importance on it. Why they bother to rescue it on its sunward course and incarcerate it in this burning ball of earth populated by the capering, briefly lived clowns called men. Brilliant description I, of people. I, I think it's a brilliant description of people, but I also like the idea of this dead god's book being some kind of weird cosmic artefact that was just yeah. passing through the solar system. And somebody I, grabbed it. Yeah, because interestingly, there are references in this. Elric does make references to the solar system. Yeah. And the you know and all that, but so it's it's, it's like um, the, the the cosmology feels slightly different in this to how it would later develop. Yeah, because then... I'm sure the suggestions later on that is are the young kingdoms on a flat Earth or you know various other stuff. I, I can't was, really remember. I think that was the current one. That was dish dish shaped, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. getting things mixed up then. Yeah. Which yeah. I still can't get my head around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the giant. Move so, back. so basically, he calls calls us all clowns. Yes, and then uh, Elwick goes, "I seek in it the truth. There is no truth, but that's of the eternal struggle." No, that this is the bit that I found quite interesting. When there's a bit of a back and forth with the giant. Yeah, I've been told that the knowledge contained in the book could swing the balance on the side of the forces of law. This disturbs me, but it appears there is another possibility which disturbs me even more. What is that? Elwick said. It could create such a tremendous impact on the multiverse that complete entropy could result. My masters do, do not desire that, for it would mean the destruction of all matter in the end. We exist only to fight, not to win. Mm. That was quite interesting, because mm. it's like chaos are just like basically fucking about going, yeah. oh, yeah, we, we love the eternal struggle, so it's a right laugh. Yeah. However, we don't want to win. Yeah. That would be terrible, because we're idiots. Yeah. <laughs> It'd all go to shit. But the brilliant thing is, after all that like amazing yeah. revelation about even the Lords of Chaos don't yeah. want to abs- actually win, they're just yeah. in it for the fight, Elric goes, I care not. Yeah. I care not, Elric told him. I have little to lose, or run Lou the Keeper. Then, then go. go. So Elric's just like, uh, whatever. Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Whatever, I just, I just want to read the book. Yeah, let me read the book. Yeah. Then we get to the book. Yeah. It was a huge book, the Dead God's book, encrusted with the alien gems from which the light sprang. It gleamed, it throbbed with light and brilliant colour. At last, breathe over it, at last the truth. But no. 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 He stumbled forward like a man made stupid with drink, his pale hands reaching for the thing he had sought with such savage bitterness. His hand touched the pulsating cover of the book and trembling, turned it back. Now I shall learn, he said half gloatingly. With a crash, the cover fell to the floor, sending the bright gems skipping and dancing over the paving stones. Beneath Elric's twitching hands lay nothing but a pile of yellowish dust. So he's dropped it, hasn't he? Yeah. What a bird. No! <laughs> the scream was anguished, unbelieving. No! Tears flowed down his contorted face as he ran his hands through the fine dust. With a groan which wrapped his whole being, he fell forward, his face hitting the disintegrated <laughs> parchment. So he basically nutted the book. Yeah. Unfortunate. Time had destroyed the book, untouched, possibly forgotten, for 300 centuries. Even the wise and powerful gods who had created it had perished, and now its knowledge followed them into oblivion. Oh, oh that's no. annoying, isn't it? 
Yeah. After all that, you know, yeah. you're expecting the truth of the the U multiverse. Yeah. And uh, nobody's been looking after it. They didn't get yeah. a librarian. Yeah. It yeah. could ten years as well. He says Elric looked with sad eyes across the world, and his head was lowered beneath a weight of weariness and dark despair. He had not spoken since his companions had dragged him sobbing from the chair <laughs> of the book. Now he raised his pale face and spoke in a voice tinged with self-mockery, sharp with bitterness. A lonely voice. The calling of hungry seabirds circling cold skies above bleak shores. That's a weird voice description, yeah. isn't it? Now, he said, I will live my life without ever knowing why I live it, whether it has purpose or not. Perhaps the book could have told me, but would I have believed it even then? I am the eternal sceptic, never sure that my actions are my own, never certain that an ultimate entity is not guiding me. I envy those who know. All I can do now is to continue my quest and hope, without hope, that before my span is ended, the truth will be presented to me. And then, Shirilla, not reading the room, <laughs> to be fair, dis- disappointingly not reading the yeah. room, took his limp hands in hers, and her eyes were wet. Elric... Let me comfort you. The old being a sneered bitterly. Would that I had never met Shirley of the Dancing Mist. Could have just said you. Yeah. <laughs> just saying, you know. For a while you gave me hope. I had thought to be at last at peace with myself, but because of you, I am left more hopeless than before. There is no salvation in this world, only malevolent doom. Goodbye. <laughs> Seems yeah. a bit harsh. Yeah, it is a he's bit not harsh. taking it well, has he? It's a bit harsh. Yeah, it might be because he nutted the book and yeah. he's probably got it stuck in his yeah. hair and everything. It gets better as well. Yeah. So Moonglum darted a glance at Shirilla and then at Elric. He took something from his purse and put it in the girl's hand. Good luck, he said. And then he was running after Elric until he got up. <laughs> Just running <laughs> after him. <laughs> Have him, Mo. Still striding, Elric turned at Moonglum's approach and despite his brooding misery said, What is it, friend Moonglum? Why do you follow me? I've followed you this far, Master Elric, and I see no reason to stop, grinned the little man. Besides, unlike yourself, I'm a materialist. We need to eat, you know. Elric frowned, feeling a warmth growing inside him. What do you mean, Moonglum? Moonglum chuckled. I take advantage of situations of any kind, where I may, he answered. He reached inside his purse and displayed something in his outstretched hand. Basically... He'd picked up all the jewels. He's got all the jewels. All the jewels. Yeah. You give Shirley a jewel. Yeah. And he says, come Elric, what new lands shall we visit so we may change these baubles into wine and pleasant company? And then the best bit of the whole thing. Yeah. Behind them, standing stock still on the hillside, Shirley stared miserably <laughs> after them until they were no longer visible. The jewel Moonglum had given her dropped from her fingers and fell, bouncing and bright until it was lost amongst the heather. Then she turned and the dark mouth of a cavern yawned before her. Oh, mate. Oh. Gutted. You know what? Bit tough on Shirilla. Yeah, that, I think... I reckon. Yeah, she... Maybe it's a girlfriend he didn't quite like. Uh, you know, so so, so what, what is the suggestion there? Is the suggestion that she just slings herself back into the cavern? Yeah, possibly. Like, you know, okay, my last opportunity to fly is I will throw myself to my death in this dark cavern because Elric blew me out because oh. he prefers... Little guys with ugly mouths. Exactly. Mm. Or she just wants to hang out with the clackars. Very, yeah, yeah, there is that. But, yeah, it is amazing. Especially when you consider the beginning of the Singing Citadel. Yes. Which just makes it all the more hilarious. Why? Well, so the Singing Citadel for me is when, because, you know, it, we're introduced to a, a certain baddie. Yeah. Who, uh, Goes on forever, doesn't it? Mm. His, his kind of rivalry. Well, it feels like it does, but actually, I don't think he's actually in that many stories. I thought he's definitely in a few more. Yeah, he's, he's in more, but it's not tons. Sleeping Sorceress, definitely. Yeah. In that. yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, book three, The Singing Citadel. Yeah, which turns out is an example of what we talked about earlier. So it's a story written in 1967 and then slotted into the narrative chronology and later established in its rightful chronological place in the Panther stroke Grafton stroke Daw stroke Granada editions published in the 70s and 80s after Elric and Mel Nibbana was released. And it's the final tale in The Weird of the White Wolf. And Although... Should we just briefly summarise the uh, Dead Gods, uh, the book 
of the one we've just read. Oh well, what, what did he? How of did course. he find that? What what we're forgetting as well is that is while the Dreaming City was um, essentially redrawn and retold as the phase one of the final program. This is essentially phase two of the final program, where the Dead Gods book is the last testament of the astronaut. Yes. What's his face? Whose yeah. name I can't remember. No, I can't the remember. difference being that doesn't dissolve. It's just when they find it, it's pages and pages and pages of handwritten ha 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 ha. I'll have to reread that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he definitely drew very, very heavily on. It's quite. A, what was this called? While the gods laugh. It's quite a ballsy thing, though, isn't it? If you, you know, as a, as an author, you go right. Okay, I've written these two short stories. Yeah. What I'll do is use exactly the same plot. Mm-hmm. Transport it into. I'll hesitate to use the word "real world," yeah, but the sixties, yeah, and do it again, yeah. It's just, it's, but also, it's its own thing. Yeah, it's a funny thing. When when I did a final program with Hussein, I don't think we ever commented on Phase Two being a retelling of well, um, shit. I keep remembering what this, what this is called. While the gods laugh. While the gods laugh, yeah. yeah. I keep putting Mad God in there, because that's yeah, Mad, so God's I, Mad God's Amulet. Yeah, Mad God's Yeah, Dead yeah. God's Book, While the Gods yeah. Laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think I actually commented on that, but it had probably been 25 years since I'd read it. Mm. So it's only really occurred to me while I was reading this, that when they get to the um, the castle of the Lords of Entropy... Yeah, I forgot all that. That's uh, just a parallel with... It's, it's the Nazi base in Lapland, where they get the the testament of the astronaut whose name I can't remember because my memory's shit. Yeah. But yeah, it is ballsy and he did do it. But you know what? He's been reinventing and revising himself for 60 years, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, totally. So this is no uh, different, really. So I thought, I, so I didn't, uh, all I remember about that story before I reread it was the end. Yeah. I can't remember Shirelia in it and Moonglum. Yeah. I was trying to remember when Moonglum appears. Cause I remember when Jarry appears as yeah. in. Um, thingy, isn't it? Yeah. Queen of the Swords. And uh, yeah, I kind of, I thought it was a bit. It wasn't, it wasn't his best work. It was all right. Yeah, you know what? It's it's. I mean, he's written that when he's like probably twenty two or twenty three. Yeah, whatever. But I think when I read Sing Sing Citadel, I really enjoyed it. You can definitely tell the six yeah. or seven years of development in yeah. his skills and, and his all, abilities and his plotting. Yeah, definitely all that. And and also there's there's kind of. A chapter written about one of the one of the other characters, isn't there, mm. from their point of view, yeah. almost. So, which is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I really, I really, really liked the singing Citadel. Even though, <clears throat> I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get to it. It's the, the 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 one thing I really like about it is it starts in media res. Yeah, yeah, and I love that. And more stories should be. Yeah. The the other thing, just to, about the while well, the gods laugh. Yeah. Is the Mist Giant? I remember the Stormbringer RPG. There was like a full page picture of Elric fighting it, which mm-hmm. was absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just reminded me. I've always got that in my head now when I think about it. Yeah, yeah. So the intro to the Singer Citadel says, in which Elric has his first dealings with Pantang, Yashana of Jakar, the sorcerer Theleb Karna, and learns something more of the higher worlds. Yeah. But this this does start in media res, and we get straight into a fight, which is great. Always always appreciate that. But yeah. We have to laugh. We've just read Shirilla's Doom. Yeah, she, she was. It didn't look good for a yeah. bit. Yeah. So these stories, in reality, are written six or seven years apart. Yeah. But this is a great example of how jarring it is when you take two things written six or seven years apart and <laughs> slam them together within two pages of each other. <laughs> yeah. It says, and it's a lovely start. It says the turquoise sea was peaceful in the golden light of early evening, and the two men at the rail of the ship stood in silence, looking north to the misty horizon. One was tall and slim, wrapped in a heavy black cloak, its cowl flung back to reveal his long, milk-white hair. The other was short and red-headed. She was a fine woman, and she loved you, said the short man at length. Why did you leave her so abruptly? She was a fine woman, the tall one replied, but she would have loved me to her cost. Let her seek her own land and stay there. I have already slain one woman who I loved, Moonglum. I would not slay another. Right, like, yeah, well, that, steady on, mate. That's not what I read. Yeah, it's like up yours, sure. There, I'm off. Yeah, steady on, and it's um, you know, they, they do appear to be discussing Shirella. It's left. They don't mention her by name, although I think they do a couple of pages later, maybe I can't yeah. remember. But it's left slightly vague, so it could work that way. If so, Elric saying he loved her 
really embeds that overly dramatic flourish that Elric has. He met her, they banged, therefore he loved her. Yeah. <laughs> Even though he blew her out in a massive sulk yeah, and left he's... her to essentially throw herself into a dank cavern. Yeah, well, basically, yeah, he said, uh, yeah, don't touch me. And... Uh... <laughs> I don't want to see you ever again. Yeah. See you later. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I loved her. Yeah. Loved her dearly. Oh, yeah. It's like that Great t- days. Teenager. Great like, oh, days. Remember there was that time when she didn't pull me out of a swamp because yeah. she was too stupid to attach it to a yeah. horse. Yeah. Yeah. Great days. Yeah. yeah. Oh, God. We, we could have been a thing. Yeah. Uh, isn't that the bird you told to hold your pint while you went for a shit? Oh, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but I loved her dearly. Yeah, yeah and yeah. she loved me. Yeah. Well, did she? Yeah. yeah. But... They they're they're on a, a ship, a Jarkorian ship, bound they for are. Dacos. Yeah, Dacos. And it's really cool starting a story this way. A couple of establishing paragraphs to note the characters, the location, then bang, new enemies and yeah. a scrap. It's yeah. great. I love it. Because Elric is interrupted by a high pitched shout from the crow's nest. Sail on Larbard Stern Whatever a Larbard is. I have no idea. No, I don't. We're from Hull, we should know these things. Well, I'm not a fisherman. No. From Hull. Well, I'm yeah. just from Hull. Well, so yeah. same people from London should be Don't deny your heritage. Yeah, not... The lookout must have been half asleep, for the ship bearing <laughs> down on them could easily be made so out it's from his the deck. Fault. Lots of people die because of his... he was asleep at the, yeah. at the watch. Not Elric right. steps aside as the captain, a dark first tackle shake came running along the deck. What's the ship, Captain? called Moonglum. A Pantang trireme, a warship, the Ron Ramming course. The captain ran on, yelling orders to the helm to turn the ship aside. Elric and Moonglum crossed the deck to see the trireme better. She was a black sailed ship, painted black and heavily gilded, with three rowers to an oar, as against their two. She was big and yet elegant, with high curving stern and a low prow. Now they could see the waters broken by a big brass sheathed ram. She had two latin rigged sails. Yeah, sure. Latin rigged. I get it. They're, they're my favourite kind of sails. Yeah. I don't and know. the wind was in her favour. Uh, the rowers were in panic mm. as they sweated to turn the ship according to the helmsman's order, yeah. which is probably, get out of the way, they're yeah. going to kill us all. I love all that stuff. The, the panic preparations and like the pessimistic efforts of the crew yeah. to avoid disaster. And all characteristically great, because I, I don't know why, but Mocock battle yarns sea are always great. Are when sea battles sea. are good. Yeah. Always. Oars rose and fell in confusion. Moonglum turned to Elric with a half smile. They'll never do it. Best ready your blade for... Oh, I'm not doing the voice. Yeah. They'll never do it. Best ready your, bl- your blade, friend. But then we were introduced to Pantang for the first time. Yeah, we get that nice recap of the island of Pantang and the villainous theocrat Jagreen Lern. Are they Pantang ever mentioned before then? At the end of the Dreaming City, Elric washes up at Pantang. Does he? He does. He does. does. He? Let me go back. Really? He, oh, what? Really? really? That's never mentioned. Oh. Why has nobody written a short story about that? Right, stand by. A night later, off the coast of an island called Pantang, when the ship was safe from the dreadful recriminations of the dragon masters and their beasts, Elric stood brooding in the stern while the men eyed him with fear and hatred, muttering of betrayal and heartless cowardice. They appeared to have forgotten their own fear and subsequent safety. Yeah, so when he escapes yeah. from the, the, the damage that the dragon masters <coughs> do to the fleet, they actually dock at Pantang. But it's just, that's it. That's the only mention of Pantang. In the dream and then he's, he, I think, probably years later, has gone. Oh, Pantang, that yeah. sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon so. We we get that little description of you know the theocrat of Pantang, chief of the priest aristocracy, Jagreen Lern, who was reputed to have a pact with the powers of chaos and a plan to rule the world. Well, we know that, don't we? Because uh, the final star is of Stormbringer. Oh yeah, yeah, he's right there. Jagreen Lern, mm, what a knobhead he is. He's a right knobhead. Uh, Elric regarded the men of Pantang as upstarts who had never hoped to mirror the glory of his ancestors. But even he had to admit that the ship was impressive. Mm. Yeah. They leap into battle. They do. To support the uh, the sailors. The Tarka the shites. And it is kind of great. Yeah. Elric stood immobile, watching as the Trireme's grappling irons hurtled towards their galley's deck. Somewhat half-heartedly, knowing there were no match for the well-trained and well-armoured Pantang crew, the Tarkashites ran towards the stern, preparing to resist the borders. Moonglum cried urgently, Elric, we must help! 
Reluctantly. Reluctantly? Oh, yeah. Um, so he was just there, just going, oh, look at this ship, it's yeah. beautiful. I'm not sure we should continue with Moonglum no, being, being broad Yorkshire, no. just because an audio book does it. And we have mentioned why we were doing that, because yeah. otherwise it would just be a bit... Yeah, everybody would think we're fucking idiots, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. I mean, we already yeah. talked like we're from all. Yeah. We're actually the... forcing a West Yorkshire accent on Poe Moonglum. Yeah, exactly. That was the audio book that I've just been listening to, just yeah. to make it Poe. Yeah. Reluctantly, Elric nodded. He was loath to draw the rune sword from its scabbard at his side. Of late, its power seemed to have increased. Now the scarlet armoured warriors were swinging towards where the Tarkashites waited. The first wave, armed with broadswords and battle axes, hit the sailors, driving them back. Now Elric's hand fell to the hilt of Stormbringer. As he gripped it and drew it, the blade gave an odd, disturbing moan, as if of anticipation, and a weird black radiance flickered along its length. Now it throbbed in Elric's hand like something alive as the Albina <laughs> ran, <laughs> ran forward to aid the Tarkashite sailors. He loves saying that it's throbbing and alive in his hand. He does. The the weird. I've got a question for you later. Mm. I'll let you carry on. Already half the des- half the defenders have been hewed down, and as the rest retreated, Elric, with Moonglum at his heels, moved forward. The scarlet arm of warriors' expressions changed from grim triumph to startlement as Elric, great blade, shrieked up and down and clove through a man's armor from shoulder to lower ribs. Evidently, they recognized him in the sword, for both were legendary. Though Moonglum was a skilled swordsman, they all but ignored him as they realised that they must concentrate all their strength on bringing Elric down if they were to survive. The old, wild, killing lust of his ancestors now dominated Elric as the blade reaped souls. He and the sword became one, and it was the sword, not Elric, that was in control. Men fell on all sides, screaming more in horror than in pain, as they realised what the sword had drawn from them. Four came at him with axes whistling. He sliced off one man's head, cut a deep gash in another's midriff lopped off an arm and drove the blade point first into the heart of the last. Now the Tarkashites were cheering, following after Elric and Moonglum as they cleared the sinking galley's decks of attackers. Howling like a wolf, Elric grabbed a rope, part of the black and gold trireme's rigging, and swung towards the enemy's decks. Roar! Follow him! Yeah. yeah. Always staring stuff. Always staring stuff. Yeah. And I always love a sea battle in these books, and... I think I've started more than one game that I've GM'd, like this chapter, probably subconsciously remembering it and factoring it in whenever I can, because I always love a fight on ship's decks. Yeah, I don't know if you remember that Elric Elric exclamation mark game that we played when your character rocked up in a rowing boat with a chest full of hats. Yes, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, and you got pulled on board, and the very next thing that happened was... Uh, a fight with Tarkashite pirates because you just can't beat chaotic RPG fighting. But you also get you get the joys of doing the swinging across boats. You do. I mean, some some of the I'm quite a fan of the Assassin Creed games. I've mm. played most of them. The Greek ones probably my favourite one. Yeah, there are a few too many kind of sea battles in it, but yeah. but they are quite cool. Yeah, just leaping boat to boat. Yeah. And, Oh, it's, it's all good stuff. <coughs> Booting people over over the board. I like I like making the players re- make like balance and reaction rolls to stop slipping in guts yeah, and yeah. blood on the decks and stuff like that. Make it as really chaotic and tangy yeah, and horrible yeah, as possible. Good. But they take the trireme anyway. But not until Elric has to defeat the captain, who's a member of the theocracy. It does a bit yeah. harder in that it lasts more than three or four swings. But Stormbringer saves Elric's bacon a couple of times. But the captain's sorcerous armor is no match for Stormbringer. And his soul is taken, allowing us one of those most amusing death exclamations, which goes, "By Shardros, not, not, ah, oh. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love it, love it." He's gone. It's cool as fuck. They've now got a Pantangian trireme because their ship has sunk. Half the Jarkarian crew are still alive, and they have a load of slaves. Yeah. Who Elric says, "I'm going to free you all." Much to the surprise and disappointment of Moonglum, who wanted to sell them when they got back into port. Yeah, and so Elric... you, had to, yeah, you had that, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> if you'd have your freedom, row well towards Dakos, Moonglum shouted incredulously. Yeah. Why well, offer them freedom? We could sell them in Dakos, and it will pay for today's exertion. Yeah. He just went, I offer them freedom because I choose to, Moonglum. Yeah. And he just goes, what a no bird. So, you know. Is Elric really evil? No. No. He just likes telling birds he's evil because he likes to be an edgelord. Yeah. And they still fall for him. Incredible, really. So, chapter two, pub. 
Yeah, pub pub again. Pub again. Moonglum's in bed. Yeah, having and, a bit and of a kip. There's a great um, little thing where it says, all the roisterers. <laughs> best he packed it in and he's left, left. left alone in the tavern. Yeah. I love that. I love roisterers. Yeah. yeah. So he's on his own, having yeah. a bit of a drink again. Yeah. But not for long. No. Because a snotty commander of the guard, Yolan, yeah. rocks up to issue a summons to see the queen, Yashana, half sister of the slain King Darmit. Yeah. Uh, uh, damn it. Yeah. yeah. Once again, Elric's reputation precedes him. And actually, this y- Count Yolan, who's this young, kind of arrogant commander of the guard, was a big fan of Darmit. He was. And he blames Elric for yeah. getting him dead. And he has a go at him. He right? does have a go at him. Yeah. But Elric gives him a massive fuck off, <laughs> yeah. which is actually quite satisfying. Because Count Yerlan is like an establishment douche. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Elric's saying, you know what, stick it up your ass, Yerlan. <laughs> yeah, he's basically <laughs> going, the Queen wants to see me. She knows where I am. Yeah. Otherwise. I'm, yeah, I'm off in morning. <laughs> I'm off in morning. She wants to see me. She's got to come here. It's cool. I dig it. And um, then, then we're introduced to uh, what will be a major villain for yeah. a bit. In some of the stories, I must say I'd forgotten this as well. Um, I, I remember that you know it was with Yashana, but it wasn't as stark in my memory that basically he's in a sub dom relationship. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With yeah, yeah, totally. And Yashana comes. Cr- <laughs> she's quite a decently written character. I think, I think she's awesome. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we've got Philip Connor. Philip Connor scowled for all his skill in the black arts. He was a fool in love. Mm. And Ishana sprawled in her fair rich bed knew it. It pleased her to have power over a man who could destroy her with a simple incantation if it were not for his love weakness. Yeah. So basically, although Philip Karno is introduced as, you know, his skill in the black arts, yeah. he's a sorcerer, he's hopelessly uh, under her thumb. Yeah. I think it's great. I think yeah. you know, is 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 there stroking her foot? Yeah. Well, well that's it, isn't it? <laughs> Though Philip Kenner kind of stood stood high in the hierarchy of Pantang, it was clear to her that she was in no danger from the sorcerer. Indeed, her intuition informed her that this man, who loved to dominate others, also needed to be dominated. She filled filled this need for him with relish. Yeah. Philip Kenner kind of continued to scowl at her. How can that decadent spell singer help you where I cannot? He muttered, sitting down on the bed and stroking her bejeweled foot. <laughs> There's a really nice description of her, which I, yeah. think, I think it does mark her out, certainly for a 60s fantasy book, as uh, well, compare it to a dis- well drawn character. Yeah, com- I think. compare it to the character of uh, Sharila. Yeah. It was like exquisite features. Yeah. She had hair. And a smashing blouse. Yeah. That was pretty much it, yeah. wasn't it? But yeah. Whereas we get, Yashana was not a young woman, neither was she pretty, yet there was a hypnotic quality about her tall, full body, her lush black hair, and her wholly sensuous face. Few of the men she had singled out for her pleasure had been able to resist her. Neither was she sweet-natured, just, wise, nor self-sacrificing. The historians would append no noble soubriquet to her name. Still, there was something so self-sufficient about her something denying the usual standards by which a person was judged, that all who knew her admired her, and she was well loved by those she ruled. Loved, rather, as a willful child is loved, yet loved with firm loyalty. Now she laughed quietly, mocking at her sorcerer lover. You're probably right, Philip Carner, but Elric is a legend, the most spoken of, least known man in the world. This is my opportunity to discover what others have only speculated on, his true character. Oh. <laughs> Philip Kerner made a pettish gesture. <laughs> He's a bit of a loser, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He stroked his long black beard and got up, walking to the table, bearing fruit and wine. And he, he's getting a bit cross that she wants to, uh, yeah. to have a word. Oh, he's not happy. And in the end, he ends up throwing his glass on the floor, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, he's well jealous and pissed off at her obsession with getting to know Elric. And I dig it. It's, I, I love this intro to these two because it's really effective and it's relatable. As well, yeah, and it's completely different as well, isn't it? You yeah. Know, instead of Philip kind of being, oh, he's evil. He's yeah. like, he's actually, he, he's not a nice man. No. Let's get us wrong, but he's also, it's entirely driven by jealousy. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and, great uh, stuff. So anyway, she does go to the pub to meet him. She does. So yeah. it works. The meet yeah. at the inn. Yeah. And when reading this, I'm struck at how much better Mocock's skills are 
the, the late sixties so. really found him hitting his stride with evocative scene setting and atmosphere. It's great. All the descriptions of the pub, just little, just little bits like yeah. you sit in darkness, Lord Elric. I had thought to find you asleep. Sleep, madam, is the occupation that bores me most. But I will light a torch if you found the darkness unattractive. He went to the table and removed the cover from the small bowl of charcoal which lay there. He reached for the thin wooden spill and placed one end in the bowl, blowing gently. Soon the charcoal glowed and the taper caught, and he touched it to a reed torch that hung in a bracket on the wall above the table. The torch flared and sent shadows skipping around the small chamber. The woman drew back a cowl, and the light caught her dark, heavy features and the masses of black hair which framed them. She contrasted strongly with a slender, aesthetic albino who stood a head taller, looking at her impassively. It's simple language, really yeah, easy, really short good. sentences, but oh, it's so evocative. And this is total. This is totally. He's drawing a lot of this stuff. This is classic Robert E. Howard, yeah. you know, scene setting type stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. I well, love then you've got the uh, the other bit of the charge. She was unused to impassive looks, and the novelty pleased her. Yeah, yeah, it's great. The exchange between them is really good. It's mature and real, and. The opposite of the previous story. Right? Absolute yeah. opposite. Yeah, diametrically opposite. It's it, it feels real and convincing. But long story short, she tells him what the score is and what she wants. Basically, it's Adventure Time. Yeah. And, I mean, Adventure Time with a capital A and a capital T because this entire Singing Citadel section is just like an episode of Adventure Time. <laughs> it's, it's very much <laughs> it's like really, Adventure it really Time. Is. Yeah, so, you know, long story short, there's a Citadel. It's singing. It yeah. is... The Singing Citadel. It is very much the Singing Citadel. And it's stealing people, including the Queen's personal hotshot guard, the White Leopards. Oh, the White Leopards, yeah. Those savages, yeah. she describes them as. When I read the White Leopards bit, I remembered, ah, oh, so not only are they setting up Jack Reed Learn and Pan Tang, not only have we just been introduced to Moonblum in the last episode, we've now got Queen Yashana and the White Leopards, all of which feature... In the end of the world story that is Stormbringer. Yeah. Because Yashana and the White Leopards are there in the battle at the end of the world, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's all, all setting it all up. It's all seeding it. It's all nice stuff. <clears throat> and then the shag. Much yeah. too <laughs> much to Thelab Kana's disappointment. It was peering at them he was. through a magic mirror. He was. In the deep greenness of a dark mirror, Thelab Kana saw something of the scene in Elik's room and he glowered impotently. He tugged at his beard as the scene faded for the tenth time in a minute. That's interesting. The feed scene faded for a tenth. Is his mirror automatically trying to fade it out in order yeah. to save their blushes or something? Possibly, or it's just a shit mirror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or he a really bad smell. He tugged at his beard smell. as the scene faded for the tenth time in a minute. It What? So every six seconds it fades. Does he then turn it back on again? Yeah, I don't know. Has it got a button or the, a lever? I, th- I think the I think the mirror must have like a, a child safety feature. Yeah, that he keeps. Or it's got a really bad battery. Or it's got a bad yeah. battery. Yeah. He tugged at his beard as the scene faded. Oh yeah, I've said that. Already. He's always tugging on his beard. Yeah. Isn't he? How big is his beard? None of his mutterings could restore it. He sat back in his chair of serpent skulls and planned vengeance. That vengeance could take time maturing, he decided, for if Elric could be useful in the matter of the Citadel, there was no point in destroying him yet. The fact that he's got a chair of serpent skulls, yeah, because that doesn't seem to be like Yashana's kind of vibe, does it? Do you reckon he brought it with him? I think so, yeah. He's got like travelling furniture Uh, to make him look more Yeah, he's he's the kind of guy, he's probably got a big caravan pulled by slaves yeah. that all of his like got all of his camphor wood yeah. weirdness in Ser- serpent chairs yeah. probably amusing hats yeah. that kind of thing I find the beard tugging relatable though because yeah, up, yeah. up until recently just before I started my new job I had a fairly lengthy Did you? beard mm-hmm. going on and um when I had a, a chat to my old boss, he went, "Oh, you've uh, you've cut your beard short." I said, "Yeah," and he said, uh, "Yeah, you you don't know you you used to pull at it when you were in meetings. You used to you used to stroke it when you were thinking." <laughs> and like, oh, so I think it's just something people with long beards do well, almost that's subconsciously. What, well, that's what beards are for, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right, it's time for more beer. So what we're going with? We are going with Vault City Fiery Ginger Iron Brew yeah. at six point four percent. Now, this is one I had left over. I had an Iron Brew-based drink when I was recording with Derek because we did a Robert Sheckley book options yeah. last time I recorded. So this is like a follow-up to that. I got them both at the same time, but I'm quite looking forward to this one because I do like fiery ginger beer and I, I do, do like Iron Brew. Yeah, I do as well. And I like beer. 
So it's like a, a holy trinity, really. So be disappointed if it isn't hitting the... Only one way to find out, isn't there? Cheers. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Let's go. Oh, God, I'll drink that in 30 seconds. Yeah, it's good, though. That's really good and really refreshing. It doesn't taste and in any way like, beery. It tastes like iron brew. It does. Yeah, it tastes with a like bit of ginger. Brew. It's 6.2%. That is a perfect summer barbecue drink. Yes, it is. Mm. That is really good. Yeah. Um, which means that very shortly, uh, when we finish this, we'll have to order some kind of grilled meat. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Definitely. Anyway, where were we? Well, we were... Uh, Yashana's basically offered him a job. Yep. Philip Khan has watched him having That's right. goals. And in all honesty, Elric doesn't really help matters when they're set off on their trip to the city. No, he, he's taking he? a piss a bit, really, isn't he? So he, um, Philip Karna and Yashana, set off for the town of Thakora. They do. Philip Karna kept a frowning distance. If Elric was at all embarrassed by this display on the part of the man he had ousted in Yashana's affections, he did not show it. Well, he doesn't show it. He, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he does. He does. Don't do any favours, though. No. Elric, finding Yashana more than attractive in spite of himself, had agreed at least to inspect the citadel and suggest what it might be and how it might be fought. He had exchanged a few words with Moonglum before setting off. We'll find out what I he said missed to Moonglum. that bit. Yeah. When I read it later, I was like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah missed that one. Yeah, it does set it up. Yeah. They rode across <clears> the beautiful grasslands of Jarkar, golden beneath the hot sun. It was two days' ride to Thakora, and Elric intended to enjoy it. Feeling less than miserable... He galloped along with Yashana, laughing with her in her enjoyment. Yet buried deeper than it would normally have been, there was a deep foreboding in his heart as they neared the mysterious citadel, and he noted that Thelab Karna occasionally looked satisfied when he should have looked disgruntled. <laughs> Sometimes Elric would shout to the sorcerer, Oh, old spellmaker! <laughs> Do you feel no joyful release from the cares of the court out here amidst the beauties of nature? Your face is long, Thelab Karna. Breathe in the untainted air and laugh with us. And you can actually then went, ah ha ha ha. Yeah, but he doesn't. Thelib Khanna would scowl and mutter, and Yashana would laugh at him and <laughs> glance brightly at Elric. Oh, there's no wonder he turns villain, is there? There's, there's I mean, a... he was probably a villain stat. Yeah, this is another one, though, isn't it? What? Are you a sorcerer from Pantang, the isle that claims to know as much as sorcery as my ancestors, the bright emperors? No, no, besides, I'm not in a cautious mood. After, yeah, Thelab kind of was going, well, maybe we shouldn't go straight in there. Yeah, yeah. He's going, what, maybe, chicken? Yeah, maybe <laughs> we should evaluate the situation. Bah, ha, 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 <laughs> you fool, chicken. I'm shaking your girlfriend, <laughs> and I'm a better sorcerer than you. Yeah, uh, t- to be honest, I... I'm very close to siding with Thelicana <laughs> in this scenario. I think Elric's being a real shit. Yeah, he's sick of the piss. He is, yeah. He's being a real shit. But anyway. They, they arrive. They do. Yeah. And the Citadel is Trip City. It really is, isn't it? It, it is. reminds me very much of uh, some of the Corum it's tripping It's very, books. very like the uh, the Swords trilogy. Yeah, it's almost into... like the Picasso of it, isn't it? Yeah, so it's it's a trippy journey. Into the the realm of uh, a chaos deity, that in this case it turns out to be well, how, not how one of the he higher work, lords. How does he work it out? He just seems to kind of guess, doesn't he? Because as they're going in, he says, uh, "Elric laughed and disturbed." Uh, Fell kind of shuddered. You have been to chaos. It is Arab, oh, yeah, yeah. because Elric's bragging still. Yeah, he's, Elric's he's, bragging. Yeah, he's that's like, right. Thel kind of says, have you seen the like in the world before? Elric shook his head. Not in this world, certainly, but I've seen it before. During my final initiation into the arts of Melnibonur, my father took him with me in astral form to the realms of chaos, there to receive the audience of my patron, the Lord Arioch of the Seven Darks. Thel kind of shuddered. You have been to chaos? It is Arioch's citadel, then? Eric, Eric <laughs> laughed in disdain. That, no, it's a hovel compared to the palace of the Lord of Chaos. Ah, oh, impatiently, you shall have said, will you two get a room? <laughs> get a room, you <laughs> idiot. Then who dwells there? As I remember, the one who dwelt in a citadel when I passed through the chaos realm in my youth, he was no lord of chaos, but he was a servant to the lords, yet not exactly a servant. Ah, oh, you speak in riddles. I'm, I'm with Philip Carner on this one again. Yeah, I am. 
turned his horse to ride down the hills away from the citadel. And he was like, oh, fuck off. I know you Melnibonians, starving. You'd rather have a paradox than food. <laughs> That'll learn him. This That's is all, not much of an insult, is It's it? all great, this, though. Yeah. I love it. But it is great, isn't it? It's like, film kind of go, oh, what a knobhead. <laughs> yeah. I hate you. Yeah. Elric is being a right twat. Yeah. Ugh. But he does explain it. Yeah. The one who dwells yonder is a paradoxical sort of fellow. He's kind of a jester to the courts of chaos. The lords of chaos respect him, perhaps fear him slightly, even though he entertains them. He delights them with cosmic riddles, with farcical satires purporting to explain the nature of the cosmic hand that holds both chaos and law in balance. He juggles enigma like baubles, laughs at what chaos holds dear, takes seriously that which they mock at. He paused and shrugged. So I've heard at least. <laughs> it seems quite confident now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> Why should he be here? <sighs> yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so I felt kind chaos. of just like, you know, fuck you, I'm off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and buggers off. Uh, so Yashana and Elric. But he mocks continue. him again, doesn't he? He does. He's one of his, his ear. Come now, sorcerer Elric mocked. I have little love for life, to be sure. There are some things of value to me, my soul for one. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm totally with Thard Karna, just buggering off and leaving him to it. Uh, but they do, they head off into this trippy uh, citadel. After the singing. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. She gets caught by the singing and she's pulled towards yeah, it. Yeah, the, the music began faintly at first, but beginning to swell with an attractive, poignant sweetness, mm. evoking nostalgic memories, offering peace and giving life a sharp meaning. Yeah, a bit like the second album of uh, Haircut 100. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well, amazingly, Elric and his wanderings <laughs> in unearthly realms had heard music like it before. Of course he had. It echoed many of the bizarre symphonies of Old, Mel- of Old Mel Nibbana. So there we go. I never really had the symphonies of Old Mel Nibbana down as being relatively reminiscent of Haircut 100. <laughs> No, but now you mention but it. But there were there were a lot of tortured uh, servants oh. screaming. Yeah, I was at it more like you know, nineteen sixty seven Georgie Fern. But... Yeah, or possibly, but all surfers B side. <laughs> <laughs> that was my other choice. Yeah, that but all surfers live in Texas bootleg. I've got somewhere. Yeah, upstairs, it's, probably, it's probably that. That's probably pretty close. Yeah, because to be fair, that would draw me. I'd be like. Oh, <laughs> must, must go. Yeah. <laughs> must go to the horrible sounding thing. Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah. So Yashana, she, she just goes, oh, the music. Yeah. I'm really into Fantastic Day or whatever Hercule 100 did. Yeah. Uh, and she goes into the Citadel. She does. And then we have Elric goes tripping around the Citadel. He does. He trips balls all the he way does. around the Citadel. Yeah. And... It's, there's a there is a nice little random encounter in here, which once again it beats Clackars hands down. Yeah, it's uh, Elric shrieks the old age old battle ululation of his foe compressed on into the citadel, slashing at the intangible images that swelled on all sides. The gateway was ahead, and Elric knew it now, for his sword had shown him where the sorry, just massive <laughs> ginger flavored <laughs> iron brew belch there. <laughs> the gateway was ahead and Elric knew it now for his sword had shown him which were mirages it was open as Elric reached the portal he paused for a moment his lips moving as he remembered an invocation that he might need later Ariok, lord of chaos patron god demon of his ancestors was a negligent power and whimful he could not rely on Ariok to aid him here unless, unless oh have a dot, 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 dot. what Whoosh. foreshadowing but before that he was also like he's going oh it's really confusing I'll get my sword out that'll help yeah and it did well it does help in the end because yeah. a golden beast with eyes of ruby fire lurks down the passage and jumps on him yeah and you know he has a bit of problem but Stormbringer sorts him out yeah. moans murmurs and pierces part of the beast's body and he takes some of its essence but yeah, it carries on being super, super trippy. And it, actually, the trippiness does go on for several pages. It, it really does, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of colours. Yeah, I do like it. But yeah, I do, yeah. I'm not going to read it all. No. Uh, but eventually, he comes to a hall, the walls of which were the same unstable shifting colours of the rest of the place. But sitting on a stool in the centre of the hall, holding his, in his hands some tiny creatures that seemed to be running around in his palm, was a small figure who looked up at Elric and grinned merrily. Welcome, King of Malnibane, and how fares the last ruler of my favourite earthly race? The figure was dressed in a shimmering motley, 
On his head was a tall spiked crown, a travesty of, and a comment upon the crowns of the mighty. His face was angular, and his mouth wide. And it is... Greetings, Lord, Lord Balo. Elric made a mock bow. Strange hospitality you offer in your welcome. So, this is written in 67, which is, I think, round about the same time he's writing King of the Swords, Queen of the Swords, mm. uh, Knight of the Swords. And it is very much like book three of any of those books in yeah, terms of the final confrontation. Yeah, go to a trippy kind of thing yeah. and meet the dude at the end. But I've got to say, whilst I've enjoyed this, mildly disappointingly, after having this exchange with Baylor where he explains what his basic plan is, yeah. which is to establish his own realm on Earth, the realm of paradox, a little from law, a little from chaos, a realm of opposites of curiosities and jokes. And Elric says, I'm thinking we already have such a world as you describe it, Lord Baylor, with no need for you to create it. You don't really get an idea of what Baylor's plan is or why he wants to do what he wants to do because Elric just thinks, well, you know what? Uh, I'm bored of this conversation and just invokes Ariok. Yeah, brings it back. Yeah. Uh, and this happens he, so often. Because Baylor offers offers him, yeah, we'll rule it together. It'll be ace. Yeah. And yeah, Elric goes, ooh, don't fancy it. Yeah. So just summons Ariok. Yeah. And Ariok turns up and goes, oh, Baylor, you massive tool. What yeah. are you doing here? You tricky trickster. Well, basically, uh, but it has got the foreshadowing because Ariok basically says, we've got plans for this realm. Yeah. And you're ballsing it up, mate. Ah. Uh. That's yes. his kind of main thing, isn't it? Yeah. So he folds him up like well, he also, a little piece of paper. But he also, Arik also has a go at Elric for summoning him all the time. Yeah, it? he does, yeah. And he goes, uh, blah, 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 Elric from behind the chesters. Do you not realise only the kings of Melnebe, Melnebe, that's not even a word, may invoke Arik and bring him to the realm of Earth? It's been their age-old privilege. And now, how much you have abused it! The Mist Giant for one. <laughs> so I was, I was just starting to think then, is, is, are the Parters and Stout starting yeah, to affect yeah. you? <laughs> I think I've had a stroke. So I think it should be all right. I just struggle. Because I would just call it Mel Nibone. Mel Nibone. Mel Nibone. Bernie Maloney. Yeah. Eric of Bernie Maloney. Anyway, so he's not happy, is he? No. Uh, but he, he folds him up, pops him in his gob and swallows him. And goes, I'm not eating him, Elric. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, it's just the bad. quickest way to get him back to where he needs to yeah. be. Yeah. Uh, the end, then. Oh, not quite. No. Not quite, because we've got to have one last monster. Yeah, A up. As Thelad Karna tries to dispose of them. A great shape was winging its way towards them. Mm. It's not a great monster. It's a crap one, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit rubbish. What is it, like a butterfly with a dude's head or something? Yeah, but because originally it's like, ooh... What is this creature? And then realise it was originally a man that's been manipulated by Thelab Karna into a monster. Yeah. So, you know, a bit of a yeah. terrible monster. And Elric's all took it out after his summoning. Yeah, he's a bit tired. Uh, so, he, he, he can't really do anything useful. But fortunately, Moonglum rocks up and distracts it. Yeah. Ah, and where's then... Moonglum been? Well, there he is. He had to save the day. But how are they going to get out of this one? Because Moonglum can't take this thing on, surely. Surely not. Surely. Ah, uh, but well. He's just about got the strength to talk Yashana into chanting into... the runes with him so they can summon Ha-Sha Star. And, that, <laughs> and that's the thing, isn't it? I reckon it'd take quite a bit of pronunciation to even get that. Yeah. So Yashana would be there going, ha sha Yeah, to no, be fair, I think... It's you not know, an easy one. Without at least three weeks of practice, <laughs> I'm not quite buying that she'd be able to actually join in this summoning. But, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. But, then, really but before that, we have about the elementals. So uh, the entity was called hash ha sha ha 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 And it was scaly and cold with no true intellect, such as men and gods possessed but an awareness which served it as well, if not better. It was brother on this plane to such entities as Mia Kla, mm -hmm. the Lord of Cats, Roof Drak, the Lord of Dogs, Roof Drak. Nuroha, the Lord of Cattle, yeah. in case you want to summon a, a cow, <laughs> yeah. and many, many others. So uh, imagine if we get it wrong. Oh, fuck, we got the cow guy. I am hungry for grilled meat <laughs> yeah, right so now. Like <laughs> I, I would I would also <laughs> summon Nura Lord of Cattle because I'm fucking starving. <laughs> yeah. But instead he goes for Hashatak the Lord of Wizards. And uh, the rune to me seems to be a bit of a rubbish poem. Yeah. 
Oh, it's, it is there. Read it. Hasha Tata. <laughs> Board of Wizards. Your children are fathers of men. Really? I appreciate the energy in which you went to that. Hasha Tata. Prince of Reptiles. Come and aid a grandchild now. You see, that doesn't even rhyme. <laughs> Fuck that. That is a shit poem. Yeah. Hashatark, father of scales, cold-blooded bringer of life. It was a bizarre scene, stroke time, <laughs> with Elric and Ishana desperately chanting the rune over and over again as Moonglum fought on, slowly losing strength. So there's Moonglum having a fight going... For fuck's sake, yeah. listen to them going, ha, shut up. Yeah. No, you've done it wrong again, Nishana. You silly cow. <laughs> and yeah. uh, he, be- he he quivered and became more curious. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Well, he does. He turns up a little slothfully to Earth, and then he eats the monster. Yeah, so we've had... Nice oh, one. So we've had ba- you know, Baylor, the Jester... Well, we'll summon Ariok. Yeah. Eat that's that done. Yeah. And then we'll get yeah. to uh, eat this creature. Yeah. I, I don't quite like just how powerful the Lizard Lord is, though, because it says the Lizard Lord turned its jeweled eyes, jeweled eyes on the creature, and its great tongue suddenly shot out towards it, curling around the monster. It shrilled in terror as it was drawn towards the Lizard Lord's great maw. Legs and arms kicked and th- as the mouth closed on it. Several gulps and harsh, harsh to heart <laughs> and swallowed Feleb Karna's prize creation. Then it turned its head uncertainly around for a few minutes and vanished. Oh, job done. Yeah, uh, once again, a bit of a summoning. Oh, easy done. But then we have a, an interesting bit at the end where Yashana is going, Oh, Elric, why don't you uh, help me rule the land? Yeah, he's like, no. Nah. She says, well, she says... Now ye the hero of Jarko, how so they did not their did not know their peril and thus feel no gratitude. And uh, your popularity with subjects must be an all lowest, madam. I do not care. You will, if your nobles lead the people in insurrection and crucify you naked in the na- in the city square. Our answer to that is: You familiar with our customs, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> As you would. <laughs> yeah. But he does want revenge. He does. He's very cross with Philip. He's very isn't cross. He? So he's like, he's you know what? We don't take revenge lightly, us Melanobanaeans. So I'm going to go and kick his butt. Yeah. Uh, but he's sodded off. Well, get, they go to the cave, don't they? And go, oh, he's not there anymore. Yeah, he's sodded off, aren't he? This moon gum's there outside going, oh, I don't want to listen to him torturing him for 300 hours. Yeah. And and Philip Carner escapes. He does. And Eric says he was more cunning than I thought. There are several caves, and I saw him in all of them. In the farthest, I discovered traces of sorcerous runes on the walls and floor. He had transported himself somewhere, and I could not discover where, in spite of deciphering most of the runes. Perhaps he went to Pantang. He cast the sodding off spell. Yeah, yeah. He'd, he'd, he'd be working out for some time. Yeah, so basically Elric's like, right, we're off to Pantang. I want to finish my business with Thelob Karna. And then Elric was sparing his horse away, riding like a man possessed or fleeing from dreadful peril. And perhaps he was both possessed and fleeing. Moonglum did not follow at once, but thoughtfully watched his friend gallop off. Not normally introspective, he wondered if Yushana had perhaps affected the Albina more strongly than he would have wished. He did not think that vengeance on Thelab Karna was Elric's prime desire in refusing to return to Dakos. Then he shrugged and clapped his hands to his steed's flanks. Racing to catch up with Elric as the cold dawn rose, wondering if they would continue towards Pantang once Dakos was far enough behind. But Elric's head contained no thoughts. Only emotion flooded him. Emotion he did not wish to analyse. His white hair streaming behind him, his dead white handsome face set, his slender hands tightly clutching the stallion's reins, he roared. And only his strange crimson eyes reflected the misery and conflict within him. In Dakos that morning, other eyes held misery, but not for too long. Yashana was a pragmatic queen. Yeah. The end. She's a good character, Yashana. Yeah, I like her. I like her a lot. She appears again. Mm. Yeah, so that was the singing citadel. So we're finished. The Weird of the White Wolf. We have four and a half years after starting it with the Dreaming City. Yeah, we've had uh, some interludes. Yeah, we have chronological interludes. Yeah. Yeah. But enjoyable enough. Yeah, the second one was so much better. Mm. So the first one was a bit like, ooh, yeah, good god. Yeah, the first one is like he's twenty one, twenty two, or so, whatever. Yeah. It's like, yeah, the Dreaming City has been really well received. I need to knock out another Elric adventure. Yeah. And it was a bit rubbish. Yeah, it's all right. 
it's all right. There's there's bits of it I like, but this was so much better and so much more. Just in terms of the way the characters are written, more relatable. Um, yeah. You know, amusing in terms of Elric's kind of dramatic monologues <laughs> yeah. about you know loving women who he basically gave fuck off pills to thirty seconds ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. But yeah, now of course, I suppose just for everybody's uh, who's listening, the reason why we've skipped over the sailor and the seas of fate is because we've got a special plan for sailor and the seas of fate. Plan within plan. Yeah, that's right. And it's all because, of course, the first instalment of Sailor and the Seas of Fate is the first All Star team up. It is in the Elric Tales, yeah. even though there are others, obviously. and it's utterly bizarre. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll be doing that one as probably as a triple or even quadruple header at some point. Maybe maybe we'll save that for the one hundredth episode. Yeah. Yeah. Because of course it does retell an episode from the quest for Tanalorn, doesn't it? And also from King of Swords. Hmm. Yeah. Because we're, al- we're almost to episode 80 already. Really? This might even be episode 80. Jesus. I don't know. I'll have to do some counting. But yeah, that so was the way got, off. We've got a bit of Elric left. What have we got? Avenger the Rose. Fucking loads of it. We're not even about 10% of it. Have we? Yeah. We've got, um, just certainly in terms of the Grafton editions, we've got Burn of the Black Sword, Vanishing Tower, Revenge of the Rose, Stormbringer. Stormbringer. Then there's the Moonbeam Roads trilogy. Oh, God, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we'll leave them for way down the line. Mm. Yeah. So there's 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 plenty more Elric to come, uh, and of course we haven't done City of Glyph of Gotham Myths, have we? Because that slots no, in. No, we haven't. That slots in somewhere along the line before yeah. we get to Stormbringer. Yeah. So loads more Elric to come eventually when we get time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, good stuff. And there's the second trilogy of Corum. Yep. Oh God, yeah, there is. Oh well, let's, you know, suffice to say, we've got plenty to keep us going. Yeah, you know, we only got halfway through our beer slate. No, no, it's probably probably wise. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to save them for uh, the next thing. Well, you have to save them until after we've stopped recording. We <laughs> <laughs> and, and keep on. Or we can drink something nice. <laughs> we down our neck. <laughs> yeah. Then I. Yeah. But for now, thank you, Laws, for returning to Darian Tom's no, to do no. the Weird of the White Wolf and wrap that up. Sorted. Mm. And we'll see you next time. When I say next time, I mean in about 30 seconds after <laughs> we've turned this recording off and ordered a kebab. Ciao for now. Ciao. Massive thanks to Lars for returning to Derry and Tom's once again to talk Elric and all that other guff. This episode ran quite long, so I will not tarry here, but we had a comment over on YouTube yesterday that I'm going to quickly read. It was from Jeremy Greenwood, 1021, and relates to our Time of the Hawk Lord episode. It reads, One of your best. We took the old conflicts so seriously. Mary Long, The Straits, Tony Blackburst's Plastic Grin. The grid has become ubiquitous and probably more benign than we feared, but we have new adversaries. Brexit, MAGA, and the Orcs of Zed. We so desperately need the Hawk Lords to burst out of the second ether in their silver machines amid howls of feedback to redeem us once again. Thanks, Jeremy. All I can say is, you're not wrong, mate. And thanks as always to our patrons for keeping this show on the road. First, those without tear, Anthony Piconti, Tim Cardos, Dave Dempster, and Sebastian Weetabix. And to our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Spong, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Brandon Mays, Dan Charnley, Dave Griffiths, Dave Foxman, Gabriel Laycock, Harvey Faulkner Aston, Jim Kirkland, Jim Jupp, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Mary Catherine, Matt Saltz, Nelbert, Ofer Ziv, Paul McRandall, PJ Cooper, Scott Butler, and Simon Perrins. And of course, thanks to our crafty Jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Christian Hundal, Ilium Weston Ra, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Graham Holden, Toby White, Thanasis Belsios, and, new to the Don Blass, Liam Turner. Welcome, Liam, and thanks for the support. An eternal thanks to our patron demons, Alistair Davison, 
Andy Clark, Andy Darby, David Lee, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Glenn Sawyer, Greg Faulkner, Gwen Barlow, Ian Stead, Imria, Jenny Stim, Jason Vogel, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Lee Gary, Mark Hebden, Marius Latowskis, Miles Riedelbato, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, Tom Murphy, Tony Malazzo, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last but never least, Robert McMillan. Enough from me. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. BITR Breakfast in the Ruins Radio is live on Radio Garden or via the web player at breakfastintheruinsradio.blogspot.com. We have our Patreon page too, and there are a few extra odds and sods on there. But for now, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods.